Uh, our final speaker today will be Alex Forhova from the London School of Economics and visiting this year at Princeton. Alex works on theories of distributive justice and he's done some important work uh, contrasting prioritarianism with egalitarianism. Good. Well, uh, thanks, everyone, for, uh, for uh, also the organizers, especially for inviting me and for, uh, for coming out on such a, a strange day and uh, for sticking with it. Um, I'll get straight to the point. The title of the talk might surprise you, Forcing the Poor to Buy Volvos. Well, think about it this way. A Volvo is meant to be the safest car there is. It's therefore a form of insurance against an accident. That's a Volvo. It ensures you, keeps you safe, even when things go off the rails, or you go off the road, right, or someone hits you, etc. So there's an analogy to be had between extremely safe cars, which are also somewhat expensive, as Volvos are, and health insurance. Now, uh, the slogan, forcing the poor to buy Volvos, comes from uh, the economist and lawyer and also director of the... Um, Office for the uh, man uh, for evaluation of policies in the United States for a, a, f a few years, Cass Sunstein, now working at Harvard. He says the following. He says, any decision on a risk reduction standard, like what to include in health insurance, should never require that the poor pay more than they are willing to pay for that risk reduction. If you require people to pay more for more comprehensive insurance than they want to pay at the given cost that, will, that they will have to bear, either through increased taxes or through direct payments or through um, premium payments up front or foregone other social benefits like the ones mentioned by people here, so pay in one sense or another, either in cash or foregone benefits, if you require them to insure themselves more than they would want to, then you're forcing them to buy Volvos. And forcing people to buy Volvos, the poor, is a very bad way of assisting the poor. Okay. That's Cass Sunstein's argument. I think it has quite a bit of appeal. However, I will argue it's entirely wrong. Okay. So I will argue that, so here's the more precise question, when, if ever, is it permissible for a government to require people to buy more comprehensive insurance than they want, Sunstein's answer, using the analogy, is no, never. So long as people are informed about the risks they want to take, that's a big if, but so long as they're informed, you never require them to buy more comprehensive insurance than they want. And I will argue that there are common circumstances in lower, less developed countries in which uh, you can require them uh, to buy more than they would want, given what they would have to pay. Okay, so I'll start with a simplifying case. I'm sorry it's not a real-world case, but I, that means I can put simple numbers on it, and I hope we can understand the core. I think there will be many real-world cases like it. I'll then give you Sunstein's argument, and I'll give you a counter-argument. So here's a core case. It's based on, in preparation for the conference, I read some of the very interesting material, including by Paul Farmer, about uh, Rondon health insurance. Uh, so that's a picture from one of the articles about this. A core case is a single plan provided by the government, which is either mandatory or the only reasonable option for insurance. That's quite important. I'm not talking about a case in which there's already a very active insurance market, and then the government is stepping in. I'll mention that case by contrast at the end. No, rather, there is no reasonable health insurance package for anyone, and the government steps in and creates one. Okay? That's an important point. Now, that is, as I understand it from my limited reading of the literature, the, a standard case in especially less developed countries. Now, it's financed, and I'll discuss two possibilities, either by donors or individuals through tax or an insurance premium, or, you know, through other benefits foregone, right? Um, 
And again, the Rwandan case at current is a mix. As I understand it, at pre in 2010, it was 50% financed by donors. Um, they want, the ambition is to move to entirely self-financing by 2020. I'm not sure the papers express some uh, question about whether that will happen. So it'll be interesting to cover both cases. A decision maker, who may be either the donor or the government, who's trying to decide what to include in the plan. And here's a crucial assumption, which is why it's so useful that I follow the, uh, my, my distinguished colleagues, that suppose we were not uh, dealing with a case of risk. Health insurance is always a case of individual risk. But suppose we were dealing with a case of certainty, where we knew for certain who would get what. This decision maker, rightly having absorbed the wisdom of my colleagues, right, uh, gives some priority to improving the well-being of those who are worse off than others. So the decision maker is not utilitarian. If you, this decision maker can give an extra utile to a worse off person or to a better off person, a utilitarian would be indifferent. This decision maker would follow the Pigou Dalton transfer principle and give it to the worse off person. But we're not under certainty. We're under a case of risk. So here's my simplified example. Suppose we have a population of 1,000 young adults. A disease will affect one person in this population, and each person's chance of developing it is one in 1,000. Each person, this is all they know about their chances. This is all the decision maker knows. So it's not like the decision maker knows, aha, it's this person who's going to get it. They have the same beliefs that each individual has. If untreated, the affected person will die young. If treated, he or she will be entirely cured. That's for simplicity. Um, the cost of universal coverage for this treatment, let's imagine, is $10 to each person. Again, it's either out of pocket, uh, either in terms of premiums or um, in terms of uh, economic or social benefits foregone. Right? Um, if there's no universal coverage, there simply will be no treatment available. You, you need to, you know, let's imagine that it has a, it has, requires pre-commitment of certain um, resources, okay? As far as each person's self-interest is concerned, everyone in this population, it's a poor population, is willing to pay up to $9 for this treatment to be included. So if you ask anyone in the population, you face a risk of one in a thousand of this disease, you will be cured if and only if you're insured. Do you want to be insured? How much would you be willing to pay? This is a standard economic cost-benefit analysis measure. They say up to $9. And I'm imagining a very poor setting. The numbers here don't matter, right? It's just for illustrative purposes. But if you think, how, why did I put nine? Why not 9,000? Well, I was reading about Rwanda. There was a small group, uh, but still significant, of the poorest who were unwilling to insure themselves even for $2 a year. That was the cost uh, in the mid-2000s. And I'm supposing that if you're very poor, money has very high importance to you. Risk reduction might have comparatively less importance to you. So I'm going to assume, just for the sake of the argument, that these preferences are rational. Given the, their risks and the importance of money to them, I will assume that it's rational. That will make my case harder to override this rational preference. Okay? So I'm not making it any easier on myself by this assumption. So let me say what happens if we include the treatment. Simplicity, expected utility, let's imagine perfect equality. This is the only thing that will affect the population, this disease. Everyone would have 50 utiles. You can call them qualities if you like or anything else. So the final utility will be 1,000 people have a lifetime utility of 50. If we exclude, there's a higher expected utility for each by hypothesis. These people's preferences track what's really of value to them. But what this means, this expected utility, compresses the 999 who don't get ill and have both their health and some extra resources. Right? So their total utility is just somewhat above 50 and one person is ill, untreated, and dies, um, and has a lifetime utility of 30. Okay? The numbers precisely don't matter. What matters is there's higher expected utility for not covering people. Here's where the equity assumption comes in. Suppose that this were a case of certainty, that we knew who the one individual was, 
Okay, it's Bob. We already knew Bob was going to get ill and die. Would we tax everyone by 0 0.08 of the 999 in order to help him? Suppose there the answer is yes. Why? Because even though it has slightly lower total utility to include this treatment, it's better, better for the worst off. But of course, we're dealing with a risky case. From the perspective of each person's expected utility, exclude is high, superior by hypothesis. So that's just to say what we said at the beginning, that each person's willingness to pay for include is less than its cost. Should the decision maker choose include? Well, here's Sunstein's argument for no. The decision maker should respect these people's willingness to pay. Uh, in valuing life, and I quote from this article, but he also does it in later articles. He says, the case for respecting willingness to pay is based on two considerations, welfare and autonomy. For welfare, he says, if people are willing to pay $9 but no more to eliminate a mortality risk of one in a thousand, their welfare is decreased by asking them to pay more. That's what he says. Of course, by this he must mean their expected welfare. And he says, if poor people are required to pay an amount for risk reduction that exceeds their willingness to pay, desirable redistribution will not result. So he says, it's bad for the poor to do this. That's his first argument. You're not helping anyone. Secondly, autonomy he says, people should be sovereign over their own lives, and the government should respect individual choices about how to use limited resources so long as these choices are informed. By informed, he doesn't mean perfect information. He means they have knowledge of the risks. If regulators do not use people's actual willingness to pay, then they are insulting their dignity. So he concludes that with the slogan, requiring poor people to buy Volvos, which is like requiring them to buy more insurance than they want, is not a good way of assisting them. So here's my counter argument. I'll attack both parts of Sunstein's point welfare. Of course, it's not true that every individual's final utility, Sunstein is focusing on their expected utility, but of course, it's not true that every individual's final utility is lowered if we include treatment. One individual's final utility, the person who becomes ill, will, by hypothesis, be greatly improved. So that means, Sunstein said, Sunstein said there is no re favorable redistribution if you include in such a case. But of course there is redistribution. There's redistribution from the healthy to the sick. Um, so uh, again, uh, in insuring people for more than they're willing to pay, even if they're poor, does, might seem it doesn't give you good redistribution, but in fact it does. It gives you redistribution to those who end up sick. So what about this idea of unanimity? No one wanted this insurance if you ask them. Right? Uh, they didn't want this to be included in the insurance. They want insurance, you're creating this insurance, but they don't want this marginal benefit to be included. Well, this unanimity, I think, is very important to respect unanimity when people are informed, not just about the risks, but about what is going to happen to them. But the unanimity in this case is due to the lack of information about what will really happen to them. Of course. If they knew what would really happen to them, what was down the road for them, 999 would indeed keep favoring exclude because they get the $10 extra in their pocket and um, they're fine. But one would favor include. So it's not a case of overriding unanimity in people's true interests. Rather, we have a case of conflict of interest, conflict of true interest rather than merely apparent interest due to lack of knowledge what will happen to individuals. So here's an argument that uh, first came from Mark, and Mark and I have kind of uh, operationalized it in a paper, in a volume that's coming out, uh, edited by many of the people here, Ulu Norheim and uh, Nir Eyal and others. Um, insofar as final well-being is of concern, if the decision maker knew what was truly in the well-being interests of each, rather than what merely appeared because of lack of information to be in their well-being interests, she would be aware of this conflict of interest between the one person who, is, who will become ill and everybody else. And I already said, by hypothesis, she knows how to resolve this conflict in favor of the worst off in this particular instance. Because the loss in total utility is small, the gain to the worst off is very great, 
So she already knows how she would resolve this conflict if she knew everyone's true interests. So here's something the decision maker knows. There's an alternative that she would rightly, invariably regard as best if she had full information, if she knew it's Bob who's going to get this disease, right? or if she knew it was Dan, or if she knew it was Ula, or if she knew it was Alex, or whoever. That would be full information. Well, if she had that information, she would always choose include, because she would always favor the person who ends up worst off. Well, here's a general principle about decision making. If a decision rightly reached with full information is at least as good as a decision reached with partial information. Information is a good thing if you're a decision maker. Who could dispute that? So it follows, whenever possible, a decision maker should decide as she would with full information. She should choose include. So even though she doesn't have full information, she can infer the thing that she would choose with full information, so she should now do that thing. Okay, autonomy. I've dealt with the welfare objection. Look at the, let's suppose a first scenario. Suppose the donor is paying and deciding. Suppose include would use funds that would otherwise redound to the population on a $10 per person basis. So in a sense, the population is paying for the program because even though the donor gives the money, the donor would otherwise use it for other things which gave everyone $10, right? Now, if you are the donor, are you violating the autonomy of the individuals in the country, imagine it's Rwanda, by saying, I'm not going to give $10 to each person via direct budgetary support and lower taxes. I'm instead going to require that the money be used for an insurance program, which will cover this person who would end up worse off, which each person values at $9. I do not think this is a violation of autonomy. You might think otherwise. Here's an analogy. Suppose you really want a, a book. A wonderful book was written in, on, on philosophy called Conversations on Ethics. <laughs> I wrote this book. So you really want this book. You've read the fabulous reviews. And instead, it's your birthday, and I come. I know you want my book. Instead, I give you a bottle of wine. OK, I have not violated your autonomy. I've not given you what you most want, but I have not violated your autonomy. Okay. These are two different things. So in this case, I think it's very simple. If the donor pays and decides, there may be other problems with the donor not doing what individuals want, but it's no, whatever it is, it's not a violation of autonomy. OK, second scenario. Suppose now the government decides and the citizens pay. Suppose we are in. The, and the world that Rwanda claims it wants to be in in 2020, where the uh, insurance program is financed entirely via um, e premiums or taxes. Okay. Here's something about the individual preferences that are elicited in willingness to pay surveys. They are individual preferences. Okay? What do you want for yourself? So this is how the questions are asked. How much would you, Alex, for example, would someone would ask me, be willing to pay for you, Alex, to be covered against this illness which affects one in a thousand people? That's the way willingness to pay questions are asked. Okay. And similarly, if we don't use willingness to pay, but instead some health uh, quality, uh, health, health um, related quality of life, it's Suppose you get this disease, how bad would that be for you? Which risks would you be willing to take to be fully cured, etc.? That's about you, the individual, the impact on you. Perhaps you're taking into account how that will impact your family, etc., but it's a very narrow circle. Now, there may be, this may be fine insofar as we want to know individual self-interested preferences or with regards to a small circle, but insurance, uh, uh, health, coverage decisions don't affect merely each individual, but also the pattern of distribution in society. Individuals also have social preferences. If you ask me, Alex, how much are you willing to pay to avoid a one in a thousand chance of death? It's a very different question from if you ask me, Alex, there are a thousand of you 
in the country if we don't ensure one person will end up untreated and die young. Now you're eliciting my social preferences. Do you think that's just? Right? Or would you want to live in a country like that? Those are two different types of preferences. Only the first are, are elicited when we do willingness to pay. So given that this is a social decision, because it affects the distribution of well-being in society, someone who prefers exclude for themselves, who says, give me the $10, I'll take the risk, right, might prefer include considering the impact on the whole society. Now, if a majority so favors include on grounds of solidarity, something that Marx stressed before, then again, the majority's autonomy is not violated by including contra uh, Sunstein's argument. Of course, the minority is being forced to buy more insurance than they want, even taking in into account their social preferences. But this is no different from forcing a minority who doesn't want to pay a tax, a, a redistributive tax, to pay it because the majority wants it for the sake of social justice. OK, third scenario. The question of creating goods versus banning transactions. Again, now suppose the government is deciding, the people are paying, and the citizens of my imagined country are not as solidaristic as I imagined they might just be. They say, yeah, 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 the pattern of uh, inequality, oh, it's so bad, you know, I still want you to exclude this and give me the 10 bucks. Okay. So let's suppose the hardest case for me yet, for my argument. Compare the following two things. There is no health insurance whatsoever. Many people would like health insurance, and the government creates a package of health insurance, which is the only package you can get, and includes more than people want, right? At the margin, they would rather have a smaller health package that was cheaper than a somewhat more inclusive one, which I'm calling include, okay? But they prefer any package of universal coverage or health insurance to there being nothing, which was the situation before, okay? That's one possible situation. The other is, Health insurance contracts include and exclude are offered in a well-functioning market. Everyone chooses exclude by hypothesis, by, the, by my assumptions. They prefer not to have the more inclusive coverage. But the government says, oh, no, 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 I'm barring you from buying exclude. You are forced to buy include. In the first scenario, there is no interference with free choice, so is my argument, right? Just a failure to give individuals what they want most, and moreover, this is what they want most because they lack information, okay? It's not fully informed preferences like your preference for, to buy my book. <laughs> this is just a preference that at least on some individuals is due to lack of information. So I think again, even though this is the citizen's government and the government is in a sense creating the only reasonable option, so forcing them to buy, either mandating it or it's the only thing they can purchase, right? I still don't think it's a violation of their autonomy, especially if the government is legitimately elected. Government officials don't always have to go with the majority or even a unanimous version of the population, so long as they, I mean, they can then be voted out, right? Uh, so long as they're pursuing legitimate goals. However, the second situation I'm willing to accept is a violation of autonomy. Even the, whether it's justifiable, I don't know. So really, I think Sunstein's autonomy argument applies in a situation in which there is already a well-functioning market and the government bars some people from engaging in transactions that they freely were already engaged in with others. Okay, so there is some room for the point that Sunstein is making. So let me summarize. I've given you... Here's the question I was asking. May the decision-maker choose include, which is what Sunstein would call forcing everyone to buy a Volvo, okay? Um, if we're in a situation in which the donor pays and decides, right, this situation, if we were to look at welfare, there's no objection, so yes, they can, they can include, contrary to Sunstein. If we consider autonomy, there's no violation of autonomy, so yes, they can choose include, considering both, absolutely, okay? If the government decides and citizens pay, if there are social preferences for include, which are not elicited in willingness to pay judgments, then again, considering welfare and autonomy, it's totally fine to 
give citizens more than they wanted from a purely individualistic perspective. If the government creates insurance that wasn't there before and just includes more than people otherwise would have wanted, again, it's fine, both in terms of well-being and autonomy. However, the one bit where I think one element of Sunstein's argument has some force is when there's already a functioning insurance market and the government prohibits certain contracts that individuals would like. Now, from my limited reading of the literature, I'm happy to be corrected. The two most common cases in very poor countries are these, or some combination of these. Rwanda is currently a combination of those two. Well, in that case, I think there's absolutely no objection. So, final slide, conclusion. Ex ante, that's to say before everyone knows what's going to happen to them. Willingness to pay being larger than individual cost for a service, that's not a necessary condition. It's not a necessary condition for including in a healthcare package. It's fine to include in a healthcare package things that people, because they don't quite know what's going to happen to them, don't want included given the cost. That might seem weird, but I've not tried to argue it's not. So this is a, a general point that, also, that Mark also stressed. The decision which health services to include is not merely determined by what each individual wants coverage for from a self, purely self-interested perspective. It's a social decision, must take into account also issues of solidarity, and therefore the distribution of final well-being. So here's, Mesa, I'll end on a paradoxical slogan. Universal coverage and what to include in the package is not an insurance decision, not only an individual insurance decision. It also has a strong solidarity element, or should do, in my opinion. Thank you.